Well, I want to welcome everybody today and thank you for tuning in. I have led church services in a number of different unusual circumstances and places and locations in my time in ministry. I've been uh, in situations where there were no lights in the sanctuary. I've been in situations where I've had to use interpreters uh, for other languages or for the hearing impaired. Uh, I remember preaching once in Haiti and there was a chicken running around at my feet uh, interrupting me as I was trying to make my way through my sermon. I've done a lot of different kinds of sermons in a lot of different kinds of places. I have never done one like this. And this isn't just going to be a sermon today. We're going to have a, a, a full service service, so to speak, just about anything that we would ordinarily do on a Sunday morning when we were all together. We want to be able to do that remotely today. So this is new for all of us. I want to thank you for, for tuning in and, and just being a part of what we're going to do today. I want to thank uh, Pastor Garrett for uh, being the technical brains behind what we're going to do today and my entire staff just for the work, uh, really abundant, abundant work that they've done all week long in just helping. Uh, we've helped each other to serve you, uh, to do what we need to do in this very, very unusual time. And again, we all want to say, if there's anything that we need to know, if there's any way that we can serve you, encourage you, support you, pray for you, uh, we, we want to know about that. One of the things that we rely on in church ministry is that Sunday morning opportunity to get together. And on Monday morning then, we, we get together as a staff and we talk, you know, who'd we see? Who'd we talk to? Who didn't we see? Who might need a phone call? Who, who's having a difficult time? Who, who can we rejoice with uh, and who can we grieve with? And we rely so much on just the, the rhythm of Sunday morning to do that. Now we don't have that. And so we're going to have to be more proactive about getting in touch with you and, and hearing from you. But we want to open that door on your end as well. Please let us know how we can serve you well during these unusual times. One of the things that we definitely want to be doing, and I think it would be so appropriate to start this way, is I want to pray for those, especially in our church family, um, that are in the healthcare industry. Uh, and there are several of us at HRCC uh, that are involved in healthcare uh, professionally and have still been working every day. And we know that many of them are, are facing higher risks. We know that many of them are working longer hours. Um, and they're just like me, but in a far more serious sense, they're in a position they've never been in before. And so I was just kind of going through our roster and praying for some of these people. I was thinking about Dr. Michael and Dr. Lauren Brommeyer. Uh, as dentists, I'm not sure how this has impacted and, and changed uh, their industry and, and, and what they've been doing over the last few days. Jen McGrath and, and her business, uh, Dr. Pat Pimentel, uh, those are some uh, medical workers that I could think of. Mary Villachetti, who's actually a respiratory therapist. We need to be praying for Mary during these days. We have a number of nurses at HRCC that are still actively working. I was thinking about Karen Corneals and Julie Hamrin and Sue Martinson, my own wife, and Kim Pullis, uh, all of whom are, are doing their rounds and doing their job every day. Um, Josh Marker, who works in the hospitality aspect of, of hospital. Um, he's working at the hospital every day. Um, and so just praying for the Marker family. I heard from the Marker family this week, and I know they're excited to be tuning in, and Jameson especially was excited that church was going to be on YouTube this week. So how you doing, Jameson? Good to see you. Um, but let's just begin by praying for those and, and others. If I missed your name, please forgive me for that. But those were some that, that came to mind as I thought about our church family uh, who might be on the front line, so to speak, of, of the healthcare aspect of what our nation is going through right now. Father, we just lift to you those who are near to us, who are part of our church family, those, Lord, whose jobs have changed so drastically in the last week or so. We ask, Lord, for their wisdom. We ask, God, that you would help them to be wise about the decisions they need to make moment by moment. And, Lord, we pray for their protection. We pray, Lord, that you would make them strong, that you would surround them with your presence, that you would make them safe. We're grateful for the work that they do, and we pray, Lord, that you would enable and equip them to do it well and with confidence. 
We thank you, Lord, for your blessing on them. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of months ago, we were excited to know that Andrew and Lissy McGarvey were planning a trip back out this way after their recent move to Colorado, and it was going to work out that they were going to be present on a Sunday morning and able to lead us in worship. Um, it's been on my schedule for worship leading for, for a number of months now, and we've just been looking forward to it. And wouldn't you know it, the Sunday morning that they were scheduled to be here in the Chicago area and, and going to lead their HRCC family in worship is this Sunday. Uh, who would have known? Well, the Lord certainly knew. Uh, and they did, in fact, travel out this way, and so they are still going to lead their HRCC family in worship. So I want to invite you right now to just join with Lissy and Andrew as they lead us in song and in worship and in praise.
I am a child. 
Well, thanks, Andrew and Lissy, for your ministry. Man, we miss you. We miss you. Uh, and it's just a joy, an unusual way to have reconnected, but a, a joy to be back with you guys and have you with us again. We just bless you as, as you guys go forward from here. And next time, next time you plan your trip to Illinois, make sure it includes the Sunday where we aren't under quarantine and you can come back and be on the platform uh, and we can just rejoice with you when you're back. Thank you for your ministry. Want to move ahead in our service time? It's time for the offering, so I'm going to ask the ushers to stay in their homes. We're going to receive the morning offering. Okay, that's done. Um, seriously, some of you guys have asked me about offerings, and I appreciate your, um, your interest in how exactly to do that. Uh, my information for you is the best way for you to give is, as it has been in the past, available on our church website. If you go to go, the number two, hrcc.org, and click on the link that says connect or give, uh, you'll find a place there where you can give using a, a credit card, a debit card, or a PayPal account. And that's a really effective way for you to continue your habit of tithes and offerings during this time. Uh, anything you give there, we would consider just to be an offering. Uh, if you had a specific purpose for it, you'd have to include a note in the portal where you give and say, oh, this is for something else. And, and we'll, of course, honor that note. In addition to that, you certainly could write out a paper check and drop it in the mail. We, uh, as long as we're able to, um, are in and out of the office a time or two during the week and, and checking the mail and getting things like that will continue uh, to keep, of course, good financial care of the church. Uh, and that would include receiving any of your checks and depositing them in the bank. You can certainly continue to do that uh, for the duration of the time that, that we aren't able to meet together. Um, but we're, we're grateful for your participation. We're grateful for everything that, that uh, you've expressed in terms of your desire to just continue to be connected and to help meet the needs of the people in the church family. I was a little worried about how today's um, event would go, just kind of putting this down on tape first. Uh, what's this going to look like? I hope it looks good. I was worried a little bit, not that I'm vain, but a little bit worried about what I would look like. I'm told the cam camera adds 10 pounds. Uh, you should know there are two cameras on me today, so that's 20 pounds, so please adjust that in your image of how I'm looking today. But I do have some words that I wanted to share with you from the Word. I feel like the question that I've had to answer the most in the last week or so is, what are we going to do now? I've had to answer that question or address that question or even just have that conversation a lot of different ways. Uh, the staff and I talked uh, a week ago. What are we going to do now as we began to see uh, the reality of the necessity to close down last Sunday? What, well, what are we going to do? You know, what is the plan? What are we going to do now? I've had conversations with a number of local pastors saying, well, what are you guys going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, what do you suppose we ought to do about this or that or, you know, ministry and things? What are we going to do now? Uh, in my own home, like many of you other parents, you know, the kids are home from school now. And so it's like, well, Dad, what are we going to do now? Uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to pass the time? Uh, as we've had to relearn how to learn with our kids and do the homeschool thing, as we've had to figure out e-learning, you know, that... that document on day one that, that we couldn't get from Tyler's teacher. Well, what are we going to do now? Uh, and Sue and I just kind of trying to figure out our new normal when it comes to a daily schedule. What are we going to do now? I've had this conversation in so many different ways, uh, in so many uh, different uh, contexts, as I'm sure each one of you have as well. But I feel like it's an important question, and it's a, it's a question that the church with a capital C the church at large has to answer now, what are we supposed to do now? What are we supposed to do now? And I would hope that the first answer to that is an obvious answer. I, I think that a lot of you are going to be very quick to say, well, we need to pray. That's what we need to do. Uh, and I want to affirm that. Of course, that's the right answer. Uh, of course, it's the obvious answer. And of course, it's the thing that we need to do. We need to pray. That's what we need to do now. But what I want to do in my message for you today is I want to dig a little bit deeper than that. Not because prayer isn't important, of course, 
but because I believe the Bible itself asks us to dig deeper than that. You see, rarely, if ever, does the Bible limit our action to just prayer. How many times do we say that when we're talking to people in a time of crisis or in a time of need? We say, well, just pray. But I was thinking about that this week as I looked through the Word of God. The phrase, just pray, isn't really a biblical phrase. The Bible rarely, if ever, says prayer is the only thing you should be doing at this point. Certainly, again, I want to be clear about this. I don't mean to diminish the importance of prayer. Prayer is always essential, but rarely is it the only, only advisable response. And here's some examples of that that I could think of. In a time of great national crisis, God told King Solomon what he wanted his people to do. He said, if my people Uh, He didn't say pray. He said, if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God said, I'm going to hear from heaven. I'm going to heal their land. Many of you have that passage from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 committed to memory. But there was more than just praying that God required of his people at that time. I was thinking of the great builder, Nehemiah, When he heard about the the destruction in Jerusalem, Nehemiah chapter 1 is this beautiful prayer that Nehemiah prayed, but you turn the page immediately to Nehemiah chapter 2, and Nehemiah says, now it's time to go talk to the king. Now it's time to leverage the assets and the resources that I have. I'm not just going to pray in chapter 1. I'm going to pray and I'm going to leverage the ability that I have to solve these problems. It was prayer and I think even of Jesus, in his greatest moment of crisis in the garden, on the night on which he would be crucified, he turned to his followers and he said, here's what I need you guys to do. Three simple words, watch and pray. It wasn't just pray. It was watch and pray. There was prayer, but there was something else beyond prayer that was required of the people of God. And I believe that this is one of those situations where yes, we need to pray, but also we need to be busy doing the work that God has required of us. So assuming that we know that we should be praying, and we're gonna do that. We're praying for a swift end to the outbreak. We're praying for wisdom for our leaders. We're praying for safety for our loved ones and for those who are on the front lines of this battle. But even as we continue to pray, What do we do now? What do God's people do? And what does God's word require of us? There are actually a few things, I think, and I want to start with one very specific thought, and that is this. Quarantining is actually a godly principle. I had determined at the beginning of the new year that this year I was going to once again read through the entire Bible in one year. I've read through the Bible cover to cover a number of times in my life, and I do it different ways at different times. This year, I decided to revisit an old plan that's a favorite way of mine to read through the Bible. It's a chronological reading plan. So I don't just begin at the beginning of the Bible and read cover to cover. This one shows me how to skip around a little bit so that the stories I'm reading, I read in the chronological order in which they happen. And what that meant is in January, of course, I did begin in the book of Genesis and and read some of the very early stories in Genesis, but then I skipped over to Job, which is one of the most ancient stories in the Bible, and then I returned to Genesis and I read the story of Abraham and Isaac and and Jacob and that family on, on through to Joseph, and I moved into Exodus and read the story of the enslavery of the Israelites in Egypt and and their escape under Moses' leadership. But as we got into February and the beginning part of March, where my chronological reading plan had me was in the book of Leviticus, which many of you will know is, is, is not a favorite passage of most Bible readers. The book of Leviticus is a book from cover to cover that has random, it would seem, rules for how the people of God were supposed to govern themselves. It has uh, the directions for the building of of the tabernacle and the different pieces of furniture. And these aren't the most exciting passages for us to read. I've read them many times as I've read through the Bible, but uh, there's very little there that I've actually preached on a Sunday morning. And I remember as 
I was reading them recently thinking to myself, I believe that the entire Bible is God's word and is useful, but it's hard for me to imagine in what context, God, I said, in what context, God, would I, would I preach some of this stuff on Sunday morning? Because there's some stuff there that I just couldn't see how it would fit into a good sermon series on the Bible's best life hacks or, or some of the other series that we've done in the past. God, how am I going to use this on a Sunday morning? One of the things that I was reading about is, is skin diseases and, and what the people of God were supposed to do or, or what the rules were for if mold or mildew were growing in your home. And it was just a few weeks back that I said to God, I, you know, when am I going to ever use this on a Sunday morning, and I know now that God said, just, just hang on about a month, because here we are. And uh, I turn my mind now to Leviticus chapter 13, which tells the story of the people of God when dealing with infections, what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to, according to the word of God, submit to the wisdom of the priest, who in that culture was also the ranking medical authority. How many of you are glad that it's not your pastor who's in charge of of, of your health care these days. But that's how it was back then. And so the book of Leviticus said, you know, if you think you might have this infection and you think it might spread to other people, you need to talk to the priest and show him uh, what that, what's happening in, in, in your life and on your body and what's going on with your physical health. In Leviticus chapter 13, verse 4, listen to this. It says, the priest is to isolate the affected person for seven days. And on the seventh day, the priest is to examine them. And if he sees that the sore is unchanged and has not spread in the skin, in other words, if everything looks okay after seven days, then he is to isolate them for seven more days. In other words, there was a 14-day quarantine, which I think coincidentally is what a lot of our doctors today are still saying is a good practice for those who are concerned that they might have a disease that is spreading. And after 14 days, the book of Leviticus says, if the skin rash didn't spread or worsen, the affected person would clean themselves up and they would rejoin the community. It goes on there to say God's people are also warned to avoid gathering in places that are known to have been infected. In the very next chapter, in Leviticus chapter 14, uh, there's instructions given to close buildings if they know that the building has signs of having been infected, including having growing mildew or growing mold on the walls. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 46 says you're supposed to close that building, and it says, and anyone who goes into the house while it is closed up, that person will be unclean. Folks, here's why that's important today. We are quick to remember the miracles of the Old Testament. We're quick to remember the supernatural healings. We're quick to remember the divine protection. Those, amer those amazing stories where God just obliterated the threat. But if that's all we know about the Bible, we are missing out on a big part of God's instructions for his people. Because while we still believe in miracles, the Bible shows us that God has also said to his people, sometimes in this life, you're going to encounter diseases that you don't know a lot about. And when that happens, take every precaution you can to avoid passing them along to each other. And that includes, I think very clearly, the idea of, social distancing or quarantining or some of the things that we've been hearing so much about in the last week or two. It's important for us to remember that there is nothing about these kinds of practices that indicates a lack of faith. For those that think that the only godly response to the threat of disease is to just pray and just trust God for either total protection or miraculous healing. For those that think that the Bible gives only those options for the people of God, I would say you think that because you haven't read the entire Bible. You've skipped over some of the boring parts in Leviticus. 
Well, I've read them for you, and, and that's why I want to share that today. I think it's more applicable today than, than perhaps ever in our lifetimes. Quarantining, social distance, shelter at home. Church, these are godly responses in times like these. And these are things that the Bible specifically instructs God's people to do. So what happens to the church in those kinds of situations? Well, the Bible doesn't really have any good stories about an entire church having to be in quarantine for a lengthy period of time. But both the Bible and history itself tell us plenty of stories about what happens when believers have been unable to gather in large groups for, for other reasons. I've heard some believers today that have complained, well, why are we shutting our churches down? The government can't make us do that. They've cited things like the separation of, of church and state that we enjoy in so many different ways in this country. But I feel like those that have questions like that aren't really understanding the real story of the church and how it has existed through time. It's important to me that you do understand and that you be able to lovingly respond to questions like that as you might encounter them. You see, the church has never been about the building. We've said it a million times again and again, oh, the church isn't the building that you go to. But guess what? Now we're being forced to live that reality out. The church isn't about the building. And as much as I love the gathering of God's people, it's not even first and foremost about a large gathering of God's people. If your concern is that you can't go to church, this is a good time to remember that Peter and Paul, James and John, and our other heroes from the New Testament, they wouldn't have even understood those words, go to church. They didn't go to church. They were the church. For them, church wasn't a place to gather. So the fact that their government gave them no place to gather was really no problem and no threat at all. Think about it from before their time. In the Old Testament, the people of God, they actually had only one temple in the entire nation. And of course, most people couldn't visit there on a regular basis. Many couldn't visit there, but maybe once a year on their pilgrimage. And so they counted on small household gatherings for their fellowship on a weekly or daily basis, their encouragement, their ongoing instruction. In the days of the New Testament, the people of God, they usually lived under government persecution, and so they couldn't gather legally either. And so they also learned to count on small household gatherings for their fellowship, for their weekly and daily encouragement, and for their instruction. And even today, throughout many parts of the world, it's precisely the same. The vast majority of our Christian brothers and sisters throughout time and space haven't had the privilege that we've had of gathering on a weekly basis freely in numbers of hundreds or thousands. They've come to depend on small gatherings, fellowships in their home, and that's how they've existed day to day and week to week. You see, the way that you and I have learned to do church, so to speak, is essentially a historical anomaly. It's not the only way to do it. And perhaps it's not even the most effective way of doing it. And so in this next season, we have the opportunity to rediscover the essence of what the church was always meant to be. I was thinking of it, it's a little bit like MTV. How many are old enough to remember the launch of MTV? MTV, what does the M in MTV stand for? Music television. MTV launched and was gonna just play music videos all day long, music, music, music. And today MTV is a channel filled with mostly reality shows about people with really, really poor morals. How about the History Channel? This one cuts me to the quick because I love history. History Channel used to actually show shows about history. And now it's mostly shows about zombies or aliens or pawn shops. 
So this is that moment when the church is saying, hey, we're, we're like a cable network. We're like, we're like TLC. We're like the learning channel. And you know what we're doing? We're getting back to actually airing program about education. No more Dr. Pimple Popper for us. No more my 600 pound life. No more say yes to the dress. We are getting back to the essence of what we were always supposed to be. So what do we do now? Well, what do we do now is really a way of saying, who are we? Who are we? Who we are is the people that do these things. First, we proclaim the good news. In a world that needs good news unlike any time in at least a generation, we proclaim the only news that is always good. How are we going to do that in these days? Well, we have to remember our proclamation. Our proclamation, we talked about this in recent weeks, church. Now it's more important than ever. Our proclamation is Jesus is Lord. The one who loves us with an everlasting love has the authority of the universe held in nail-scarred hands. No matter what happens with this virus, we who are in Christ live in a kingdom where death has been defeated and has lost its right to have the final word. Jesus is Lord. And so we proclaim that no matter what. Second, we take care of each other. We dedicate ourselves to making sure that each one in the HRCC family has access to what God has provided for them. Now, most of us cannot or, or should not gather face-to-face -face at this time, but we have assets that the early church never did. We have telephones. And yeah, social media and, and text messages are great, but you know what's better than that and what we need to return to today? The sound of a human voice. How about FaceTime where we can actually see each other and talk to each other? We need to be better about connecting that way in these days. And when we discover a need that, that can be met, well, then we leverage the resources of this community to see that it is met. Thirdly, we take greater responsibility for our own spiritual growth. In the book of Acts, as they were living through the first days of the church, Acts chapter 2 Verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That they there isn't Peter and Paul and James and John. It was the common everyday people whose names have been lost to history. It was the they, it was the rank and file. It was the every man and every woman of the church. And it says they devoted themselves to what was going on at the time. They took responsibility for their own spiritual growth. Moms and dads, your kids need you to lead them in prayer. The leaders in kids' church and, and in core and kick, they aren't going to be able to do it for a while. Many of you may never have prayed out loud with them before, but guess what? You're up to bat now. You're up to bat now. This is your moment to shine. And for all of us, if if you don't have a daily Bible reading habit, if you didn't have that before, man, now is the time. You can't wait for the pastor to dole out a little bit of spiritual milk on Sunday morning because you need to eat meat every day. The world just got really tough and each one of us needs our spiritual strength. We need to take greater responsibility for our own spiritual growth. I think those are the things that we need to be doing right now. And as I look at the story of the church as described in Scripture, I look for the answers. Well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen as we start doing those things? What's going to happen when we commit ourselves to proclaiming the good news? What's going to happen when we commit ourselves to taking care of each other? What's going to happen as we take personal responsibility for our own spiritual growth? What's going to happen when those things happen? Kingdom's going to grow. The kingdom's going to grow. In the book of Acts, and I, I turn to three different places, it says that when they proclaim the good news in Acts chapter 2, 
We're told about 3,000 were added to their number in just one day. Wouldn't we love to see statistics like that when we turned on the evening news? It says, when the early church dedicated itself to actually taking care of its needs, they had difficulty in the early church making sure that hungry people were getting the meals that they needed. And so the church made that their focus. And they assigned that responsibility to deacons and to leaders in the church. And in Acts chapter 6, it says, when they did that, the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And as I said, the the word says they took greater responsibility for their own day-to-day spiritual growth. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, and when they did that, the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Church, what do we do now? We do these things, but I believe that the Spirit of God is showing us that as we do these things, He is preparing to take our church, HRCC, and other churches like ours on a journey of incredible, incredible growth. These days are unforeseen to many of us and unknown to all of us. But I am compelled as I read the word of God that these are days which are filled with opportunity that we have not yet seen. And so my word for you on this, our first of I don't know how many quarantined sermons, my word for you is look for the opportunities. Look at the opportunities that are in front of us right now. Dedicate yourselves to doing the kind of things that that we talked about today, proclaiming the good news. You don't need to go outside and get yourself a megaphone and and start reading the Bible uh, through the megaphone and blaring it into the homes of your neighbors. All you need to do is make sure that you are orienting your life in such a way that every action you take falls in line with your conviction that Jesus is Lord. Taking care of one another. It's something that we want to do very, very well. I encourage you to make sure that you spend time every day, whether it's calling one or two or three people. Some of you will have more time than that. Use your church directory. Connect with folks that might be on your heart or on your mind. Maybe connect with somebody that you don't know very well and just say, look, the Lord put you on my mind. Is there anything I can pray with you about? This is the time to do that. And taking responsibility for your own spiritual growth. Church, Pastor Garrett, Pastor Rachel, other leaders in the church, the deacons, Jim K. Hall, Pastor Marianne, myself, we're all here for you. We, we want to be a part of that journey in your life. But we just aren't going to be able to do it the way we're used to doing it. And so we want to invite you to a place where you're going to try some things you've never tried before. We want to invite you to step out. Begin to pray in your homes like you haven't before. Begin to dedicate yourself to the Word of God. And when you read something that you don't understand, man, that's the time to send me a message. That's the time to give me a call or shoot me an email. Man, I'll help you through that. But you have a role to play in the advancing kingdom of God. And as much as there is to to be concerned about, as many questions as are yet unanswered in terms of what lies ahead and that big question that I started with, what are we going to do now? Boy, I don't have the answers to all those details. But I know this. God is faithful. The Spirit of God is moving. The Spirit of God is moving through His church, perhaps now unlike at any other point in our lifetime. And I'm excited to think about what the future might hold for us. Would you join me in just praying to that end and to that effect? Oh, Father, we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. We come into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. Your word reminds us to be thankful in all circumstances. And so we are thankful. God, I am not thankful that there is a disease that is hurting people that we love. 
I am not thankful that our lives have been turned upside down. I'm not happy about those things. But Lord, I am thankful that my brothers and sisters and I serve the risen Savior. We are subject to a kingdom where Jesus is Lord and death has no authority. And so, yes, Lord, I'm thankful. And God, it is with a tremendous amount of hope that I look to what is yet unknown in the days to come. I look forward with hope because, God, I I think I know this about your character. I think I know that when the church faces its biggest challenge, we serve the bigger God. I know, Lord, that your power is perfect in our times of weakness. And I know, Lord, that it is your desire that your church would flourish and would grow. And so we submit ourselves to your purposes at this time. Lord, help us to be diligent. Help us to use, uh, for, for many of us, we have, we have unaccounted for time in our days. Help us to use that time well. Others among us, by virtue of our responsibilities, have become very, very busy. Busier than we anticipated. Lord, help us not to be so busy that we miss out on what you are calling us to. Help us, Lord, to be attuned to what your Spirit is doing that we might participate in the great work of the kingdom. We thank you for all of these things and we ask them in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in and for joining us on this platform. We're going to continue to communicate one with another in all the different ways that that we know how. If you are on Facebook, one of the best things you can do is follow the HRCC Facebook page. It's a great way for us to get information to you in a timely fashion. One way or another, just know that our heart is to stay connected with you, to continue to serve you and to serve you well and to see God's best for you, for your household, for your loved ones. God bless you this week. Amen.